that now he works at WorldLink as our investment advisor for uh, anything and everything that pertains to blockchain. Hey, thank you. Am, am I still up here? Or? I'm, I'm up. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so we at WorldLink uh, decided to fly in five startups representing what we believe are the most relevant use cases to blockchain. Uh, those use cases include supply chain management, identity management, uh, data registry, IoT applications, and financial applications. Uh, so our first startup that we're bringing up, a uh, startup c uh, called Factum, they're based in um, Austin, Texas, and uh, they're creating solutions in the uh, data layer space. So uh, after each startup presents, we're going to do a quick Q&A from the audience. So please, uh, you know, if you have questions, feel free to ask. There we go. How about that? <clears throat> so my name is Peter Kirby. I'm the CEO of Factum. Um, as Adam sort of mentioned, this, uh, this concept of blockchain has really transitioned quite a bit. When we very first started back in 2014, it was guys in ripped t-shirts and now we're sitting in a room full of grown-ups in suits and Hermes ties. So I really just want to appreciate how far this concept has come and the number of very smart people who've become involved. And I think that's because we're onto something very interesting. So as Adam mentioned, this all began with Bitcoin. And Bitcoin's just a way to send money across, uh, you know, from one person to another. But uh, the very interesting thing about Bitcoin is there's no CEO of Bitcoin. There's no government in charge of Bitcoin. There's no Fed in charge of Bitcoin. It is a public utility network. And there's a couple of really important features. Adam sort of hinted about this, but I, I want to drive them home. The first is this idea of permanence. This is a really old-fashioned title record. But the way they used to do this is write one title after the next title and you just write them in sequence, and it becomes really, really hard to change them. That's the same idea behind blockchains. It's permanent. It's you write it once, you can never change it, and every new transaction gets layered on top of the previous one. The next is this idea of transparency. It all takes place in the open. It's a public network. And finally, this idea that it's a public utility. It's not owned by anybody, just like the internet. It belongs to all of us. So these are really interesting concepts, and what we did at Factum is we said, okay, Bitcoin's amazing, but it's not perfect. It's too slow, it's too expensive, and as Adam mentioned, there's a big scalability problem. It does seven transactions a second. That's an awful long way away from a MasterCard that does 40,000 transactions a second. So what we did at Factum is we said, the most interesting thing about blockchains is record keeping, keeping track of what happened when. And what we did is we built a really large layer on top of all this blockchain in order to handle data. So if Bitcoin does seven transactions a second and does it in 10 minute blocks and does it at a, a high expense, Factum does millions of transactions. And it allows us to do them very quick and very, um, very inexpensively. So that lets us start thinking about data problems, not just financial transaction problems. So this network is live. It's been live since, since 2015. There's about 100 million entries on it. And um, some of our customers include the US Department of Homeland Security and the Gates Foundation. So um, we think this is working pretty well. And, um, and it is demonstrated to be stable and robust. So I just put this slide up here just so you guys can divide the universe. I think that's always useful in these. Um, there's the world of digital currency, which Adam mentioned. Bitcoin's the obvious one. There's a world of smart contracts that got hinted at, which is basically the idea of an if-then statement with money attached, securities. And then obviously in the bottom right-hand corner is this idea of record keeping. The what happened when in a time-stamped way that you can't go back and change. And it turns out that a bank is basically a big stack of records. An insurance company is a big stack of records. A government's a big stack of records. Record keeping is one of the fundamental things that institutions do. So, so what and who cares and how does any of this make money? That's why we're all here. We launched last month a product we call Factum Harmony. Um, and what it basically is, is a record keeping system for the mortgage industry that allows us to keep track of what happened when. I'm sure a lot of you saw this movie, The, the Big Short, right? Everybody's yelling at, uh, at, at, at this sleazy Wall Street guy. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, but basically, the U.S. mortgage industry in 2008 was the record keeping was so disastrous that we nearly took down the world economy. So um, what happened was we, we as, a, as a country rolled out a great big mess of laws called the Dodd-Frank uh, laws. And the cost of compliance and the cost of auditing and the cost of keeping track of what happened in mortgage records tripled the cost of originations. So it used to cost about 2,500 bucks to do a mortgage. Now it costs 7,500 bucks. So that industry added $50 billion in costs in the last eight years. So what we basically said is it's a record keeping problem. Keeping track of what happened when is really important. To Adam's point, the blockchain is just basically a way to get third party trusted people out of the way and have it be uh, dictated by math. So it was a really good fit. Basically, the very simple way to think about it is a mortgage is just a series of documents, appraisals, credit, pay stubs, title, et cetera. And if we take a hash of those, hash is just a fancy word for a fingerprint of a document. One way, you can't go backwards. Um, take a hash of those, publish them. Now you have proof and time stamped of what exactly those documents were. Um, and the really simple way to think about it is that way I can prove if it's an original copy or an exact replica of a copy where I don't change a single copy, a comma, or I can tell if it's a bad copy. And um, it turns out that when it comes to audit and compliance problems, the ability to know for sure that that's the document that you sent to a borrower or that's what a borrower signed creates a tremendous amount of value. Um, the other idea is that you can take some of the metadata, the things that would be published in like a courthouse, and you put it also into the blockchain. Um, and this is a really complicated slide, but just think of it like the whole thing becomes a card catalog for the mortgage industry. Um, so, the, so this is the idea. We launched this product last month. Um, we already have um, three very, very large financial institutions that we're in contract negotiations with. Uh, we have a v the, <laughs> the Mortgage Technology uh, Bankers Association um, booth that we ran had two or three deep sometimes uh, waiting to talk to us. So there's a lot of really great feedback in that space because it solves an actual problem with actual technology that works today. So that's basically what we're up to. Um, I'll just take a moment and answer questions. And not a single one. <laughs> Yeah, so what we did is uh, uh, Bitcoin exists already. It's a pretty robust network. It burns lots and lots of power and creates a very secure, think of it like a bedrock layer. And then we can put on top of that a data structure. Um, we use a trick that we call, uh, that's called a Merkle tree. You take 1,000 items, you hash them together to 500, you hash it together to 250, all the way down to one. And you can publish that Merkle root into Bitcoin and that allows you to do not just a thousand, but a hundred million. So it's a, it's a way to structure the data in a, uh, that allows for massive scalability. And it basically uh, inherits all of those qualities of public and transparent and um, owned by all of us. Go ahead. <laughs> no, Adam would, uh, Adam would be very upset at us. Um, so Factum is a public network. You can look it up. Um, and uh, what we're doing, so there's a puzzle, right? Because if you publish a credit report or social security number, that's obviously very dangerous. But what you're doing is you're publishing not the data from borrowers. You're publishing proof of the data from borrowers. And that's really the trick. So that's how it becomes a, a collection of cryptographic proofs and an audit trail rather than actual borrower data. Go ahead. I'm not promising we can get it all the way down to 2,500 bucks, uh, but uh, what banks basically did, there's probably some bankers in the room, uh, and they'll vouch. Okay, so basically, in order to, to solve for the dot franc laws, um, they threw bodies at the problem. So you've got checkers rechecking the checkers, checking the checkers, and then you've got a whole extra layer of QC and audit. So it just worked out to be like those costs are actually labor costs. Getting the documentation correct 
at the post-close phase when the whole thing is finally signed just means that you don't have to go back and recheck. So you can drop labor costs significantly. Yeah, of course. So um, this is, like I said, this is a bit of a complicated slide, but imagine you've got a lender storage system, you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Quicken, um, and they run FileNet or some other sort of thing. Um, so that yellow line represents a single mortgage and all of the data associated with it, and those are pointers back to lender system, or let's say you store it, uh, a document at Deutsche Bank's custodian system. It's a pointer back to that. So think of it as a collection of pointers back to where exactly it is in the industry. And that allows the lender to keep all the private borrower data without um, you having to trust the lender's ability to keep track of that record. So if the CFPB comes in and audits or the OCC, then you say basically, don't trust us, we've got external proof of it. And that was kind of Adam's point, that it, cr it takes the third party trust out of the system. Um, you mean if the lender, uh, so, so the pointer actually points back to the database in FileNet. If they delete it, let's say they delete it by accident, the system keeps track of the history of it. So you can A, say, oops, they deleted it, and B, is there a previous copy that would still be valid? So let's say what, what happens a lot of times is the, the, the loans get transferred. Wells Fargo sells it to, uh, to Goldman. Um, they transfer everything over to Goldman, but the pointers remain back to the Wells system, so if Goldman deletes something, you can go back and pull the Wells version. Yeah, yeah, built into the system is the ability to transfer. You know, when, when the lenders transfer from one file net to the other, the blockchain is tracking where it now points to. Okay, Peter, I think we have one more question. Oh yeah, absolutely, go ahead. Um, so, uh, uh, the, the bankers in the room will, will sort of vouch that they know that this is a problem. They've been looking for, uh, you know, sort of tools that provide evidence of compliance. That's one of the big CFPB pushes. Um, so, we, so we recognize that it's the, that's a problem. The uh, customers are acknowledging, yes, that's a problem. Yes, we're willing to pay in that, in that range. There's a couple of, okay, what is a blockchain and how does this cryptographic proof stuff work? So we get those kinds of pushbacks. Um, a lot of that is answered by, it just piggybacks on a lot of existing e-doc and uh, e-vaulting solutions that they already have in place. And then there's just the normal technology hurdles. How do you get it installed in our system? Does it integrate with FileNet? Does it do that? So um, um, bank procurement, for anybody who knows that, is, is obviously a, a serious process because these are big institutions. But um, we, we brought on board people who are actual mortgage experts and have a lot of experience like selling into these banks and then also uh, deploying the systems once they're sold. Sure. One more. Um, uh, so obviously we're always looking at things, but right now we think this idea of not holding the private borrower data is more comfortable for the financial institutions and also v much more comfortable for us from a security point of view. So we don't really want to get in the business of storing this right now. IBM and Oracle and all these, uh, these companies have been doing it pretty decently for a while. Um, what they're missing is the external proof and then also the external tracking as things get deleted in FileNet, for example. Okay, guys, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you again, and thanks to Adam. Really appreciate thanks, it, Senator Gasson. Thank so uh, our next startup is, uh, as you can see, it's Filament. Um,